Hello everyone! It's been a while, eh? This video is a mixture of an update video and a game dev log. I'll be talking about what I've been up to, the struggles my projects have been facing, and what's coming next. So, let's begin! First off, Mariposa and the Galaxy Man. What's going on with that? Well, to be honest, pretty much nothing. After the Kickstarter didn't work out, we've been searching for alternate funding methods, but nothing has worked so far. We then decided to work on the fantastic Kitty Roo, which was a tiny rhythm adventure game set in the same galaxy that served as a backstory to one of Mariposa's characters. It was a very fun and super educational experience to work on, since it's the first finished, purchasable game my team and I have shipped. We tried various methods of marketing it, using different websites that gave keys to streamers and content creators in exchange for them making content about the game to promote it. While these sites worked, as we got quite a few people to stream the game, and their staff were very nice to work with, ultimately the game sold very poorly, and we were not able to make anything close to a profit. I don't think it was the site's fault, however, it seems to be mostly circumstantial, as well as a result of the nature of the game. No bigger streamers or YouTubers ended up making videos about the game. This was the same case when promoting the Mariposa demo. While I am incredibly grateful to all of those people who played it, unfortunately, no audience has been big enough to propel enough people to buy the game for themselves. This might also have been due to the game itself being only around two hours to play, and mostly story-based, meaning viewers didn't really need to play it for themselves to get enough of a different experience. I don't blame larger content creators for not playing it, not at all. They can get thousands of emails a week asking people to play their games, and to be frank, I don't know how well my game stands out. And due to the nature of the game, it may seem a bit too strange. Thinking about it in hindsight, the Fantastic Kitty Roo is kind of weird. It's a rhythm game, an adventure game, and a visual novel all in one. Plus, the setting is fairly outlandish, being a retro-futuristic, steampunk-like, giant tree city populated with cat alien people. I wonder if the weird mixage of all of these disparate elements turned some folks off from wanting to try it. The genre of the game was also hard to find an audience for. And looking at the Steam page, it says here there are only four reviews, which is not enough to give it a positive score. Now, if you scroll down, however, you'll see there are actually 19 reviews, but Steam doesn't count the reviews of people who are given keys for free as part of the overall score, which means only people who bought the game on Steam are able to count towards the positive score. So someone who happens to stumble across this Steam page without knowing what the game is may glance right here to see what people thought about the game. But since there are only four reviews, that person may quickly make a decision in their brain that the game isn't well known enough to bother with, and move on from there. After all, it doesn't even say if those reviews are positive or not. But if someone does go looking at the reviews by scrolling down the page, they'll find that there are 19 of them, and all of them are positive recommendations. One of the most popular reviews does give the criticism that they felt the game was too short for the price. So in response, I ended up lowering the price from $16.99 to $11.99. But because that review is still worded like that, some folks reading it may think that the reviewer is referring to the $11.99 price in bulk. Not a fault of the reviewer, but an unfortunate circumstance. So, the game overall lost quite a bit of money. Obviously, I won't be able to make the big Mariposa game yet when I don't have any capital to spend on it. So, what now? In December, after the game launched to little attention, I felt a bit like everything was over. I'd failed once again. Neither of my books were able to get publishers, my YouTube channel was slowly bleeding subscribers, both my Kickstarters had failed, I hadn't been able to find a job in the industry, and now my game flopped. What could I do next? I was done for, right? In other words, I was having a pity party. I decided to keep moving forward and start toying with other projects. I played with a few book ideas, wanted to return to Spectral Lakes, or maybe do something else entirely. I didn't have money to hire anyone, so I had to find something I could do on my own, at least for now. One of my contingency plans for not receiving enough sales to make Mariposa was to make another smaller game set in the same universe, this time on the 1940s themed planet of Noives. However, since I didn't even make profit, I didn't feel like I should even try to work on it. 
But inspiration works in mysterious ways. And even though it felt like a dumb idea, since I knew I wouldn't be able to finish this game without money to hire help, I just kept getting more ideas for the game concept and pretty much zero motivation to work on anything else. I laid out my game design ideas, gathered reference photos, put together character profiles, made a playlist of songs that inspired the story, and things spiraled from there. I had always envisioned Neuvest to be a world of mostly black and white, since it was inspired by the noir genre. This is a planet mostly covered by snow, with some of its biggest metropolitan centers underground in giant crystal caverns, housing art deco skyscrapers on both the ground and hanging from the ceiling. The peoples of this world were humanoid, unicorn-like aliens called Psyquine. They can use psychic powers themed after radio waves. They can use telekinesis, create platforms in mid-air to walk on, and talk telepathically to one another. Their skin has a kind of light sparkle to it, as if infused with marble. For this particular story, it follows the character of Judith Hovern, a character in the planned story of Mariposa. She's a spy for a royal intelligence agency, but in this game she would be a child attending school. Judith's grown-up world was noir-styled, full of intrigue, thrills, train action scenes, and jazz. But I wanted the school she grew up in to have a different type of atmosphere. I wanted it to feel old, creepy, and filled with history. The shiny, glamorous, modern look of Art Deco didn't feel right for such a setting. So I decided to theme the school setting after another aesthetic that uses black and white extensively. It's a bit hard to describe in a way other than the Tim Burton, Henry Selleck type look. Some other inspirations included The Secret Garden, Narnia, A Series of Unfortunate Events, Limbo, Nancy Drew, Secret of Blackmore Manor, and, of course, giant gothic schools filled with secrets and students with strange powers surely brings to mind Harry Potter. But I wanted to do the concept in my own, hopefully unique way. Now I was drawing concept art of the characters, a set of students to act as important characters in the story. Designing black and white characters is tough. You have to balance the values enough so that they stand out from one another in their backgrounds. I decided a while ago that the Psyquine would have some spots of color on them to help them pop. Judith received red lips, gloves, and reddish eyes. The spirals on her horn and the metallic circles on her body, which many Psyquine get to help supplement their spell power, were golden. The colored eyes and gloves became a recurring theme in Psyquine design, mostly inspired by the costumes of the Phantom Thieves from Persona 5. I wondered why it might be the case that gloves are worn by every character, and why they are such an important piece of clothing to their culture. I knew why aesthetically, but culturally? Perhaps, I wondered, the fingers of the Psyquine are sensitive and contain metallic discs on their fingertips that allow them to resonate with the crystals they touch on animals or in caverns. When resonating with a crystal, maybe they could gauge the size of a cavern, detect movement within the tunnel, and more. Additionally, what if shaking hands with someone while not wearing gloves meant you were able to connect with their horn's frequency and therefore telepathically call them? Shaking hands, then, would be like exchanging phone numbers. Let me introduce you to a part of the cast of characters so far. This is Judith Hovern, of course. She's a sly, somewhat manipulative girl who causes trouble in the school due to her general disdain for its rules. She will often be found sneaking around at night, filching food from the teacher's lounge, or traipsing about in hidden passages. She loves puzzles, ciphers, and mysteries. This is Lydia Cabrera. She's a tomboy artist whose work is very messy and has hard, high-pressure brushstrokes. If you get her angry, she'll probably headbutt you. Gina Wendigon is an enthusiastic actor who was recently cast as a fluff bat in an upcoming school play. She is so dedicated to playing it perfectly that she is now method acting as a bat all the time, even if the play is months away. Becky Landerhoof at first seems like the spoiled, bratty type, but she is actually quite considerate, just has high expectations of others. She is the leader of the Historical Reenactment Club at the school. Marisol Aker believes herself to be descended from royalty and insists on playing the part during historical reenactments. She is best friends with Becky and loves spooky things and horror stories. 
She loves to claim that her royal ancestor's head was lopped off. This is the bard of the inked wastes. He is a traveling musician with a checkered past who hails from the inked wastes, a terrible black desert that stretches to an inky sea containing loathsome creatures. The main story of the game and character arcs have been already plotted from beginning to end. I'd like to work on writing the script next. The description for the plot goes as follows. On the cold planet of Noives lies a school with a dark and storied history called Noirmore Academy. Judith Havern, one of the psychically talented students attending this institution, is a troubled but wickedly smart student who has a special interest in discovering the forbidden secrets of the school. When one of the new teachers is violently kidnapped during the night, and Judith is the only witness, she must use her wit, psychic power, and puzzle-solving skills to illuminate the identity of the culprit and save the school. So what about the gameplay? That's pretty darn important, no? Of course. I want Noirmore Academy to be a third-person puzzle adventure game. The school would be an open area to explore and talk to various characters in, and almost every room would have puzzles to solve. As you complete the main quest, the days would move forward and characters would change places and be doing different things. You need to find items, complete tasks, and navigate tricky conversations to build relationships. So yes, the three core pillars of gameplay are puzzle solving, conversation, and exploring. Think of the Nancy Drew adventure games, except in a fully 3D environment. So how am I going to get this funded? Well, I've been considering trying another Kickstarter, this time with a smaller goal than Mariposa's, since it's a smaller game. However, I am definitely afraid that I still don't have the audience and reach to get it funded. It would admittedly be very hard on me if another one failed. Alternatively, I could have it continually funded through Indiegogo, and however much I earn through there over time can help with development. This seems like the best option, but what if I don't earn enough to make the game? Hmm. An option that I'm also going to seek out is publishers. Mariposa has not been able to find a publisher yet, but maybe Noirmar Academy, with its smaller scope, is more approachable for an indie publisher. What do you guys think? And do you have any ideas about marketing and audience reach? Please let me know. Oh, and I've also partnered with Caius Nelson from Studio Syndicate to create a bite-sized platformer game that'll be coming out very soon. This tiny adventure will be a fun romp through a super world. More news coming soon. As for one final note, this background I've been using throughout the video is a work in progress art test I've been tinkering on for the environment art of the game. I'm thinking of using it as the location of a small demo of the game for the Kickstarter or Indiegogo. This is the history classroom, and as you'll probably notice, it's not done yet, with some objects not textured. I hope you enjoyed taking a look through it. Please support these videos on Patreon. Also, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. The Fantastic Kitty Roo is now available on Steam. Link in the description below.